Hi, this is Charlie Montotobiello with Blue Bear Flutes. Of course, you know our website, bluebearflutes.com. Our Instagram is under Blue Bear Flutes, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, gosh, everything is under Blue Bear Flutes these days, I think, that we do. Um, and of course, too, don't forget, if you like this video at the end, please make sure you subscribe to our videos as well as click that little bell icon so that you can get updates on the newest, coolest flute making videos that we ever make. And sometimes we make videos on how to play the flute. We make videos on how to do so many different things. Most of them are either around or associated with Native American culture or flute making in general or Native American flute making specifically. So uh, we have a lot to share and are going strong. So anyway, what we're going to make today is actually something that I had made originally in another video, uh, which was, I think, a 2016 Christmas uh, video, we made a cardboard wrapping paper flute, which I actually have here with me. If you'd like to see it, could you hand that to me? And this little guy here, I don't know many of you have seen that video. That's probably one of our least viewed videos and one of my absolute favorite that I ever made because I made a cardboard wrapping paper tube flute and it plays. Let's see if it still plays now. Really one of my favorite videos I ever made. So something to go back and look at. I think that was 2016. And my little boy actually, uh, at the time he was little, of course he's grown up quite a bit now, had made this crane totem for us that we put on the block. So um, really is a, a, a keepsake that stays on my bookshelf and I love it. Something a lot of fun and I do pick it up and play it pretty regularly. It's actually in the key of F sharp and turned out just amazing. So what we're going to do today is using another cardboard tube, which is a little larger than that one. We're going to make a flute, hopefully in or near at least the key of low E. And uh, after we get finished making this flute, I might go and do a few other things to it to see if I can't spice it up a little bit to make it a little more, uh, I guess, permanent. Because this cardboard tube is very thin. It came off of a Christmas wrapping paper roll and um, have been saving it for some time. Uh, to make a flute out of, and this is a perfect opportunity. So anyway, having said that, I'm going to tell you some specifics about it, but don't let these specifics slow you down, make you think that you need to uh, find exactly that particular kind of material to make your flute with, because you can make a flute out of and like anything you want. So this tube is about, let's see here, roughly one and a quarter inches on the outside diameter. And given the thickness, I'd be willing to bet the inside is perfectly one and a quarter, which is why I was able, it is, to look out and found a dowel that was exactly one and a quarter. I already cut it to this little size. Um, the dowel here is about an inch. It doesn't have to be. It's between an inch and, and three quarters. It looks like it's probably about seven eighths of an inch long. I usually make them about an inch. Seven eighths is fine. But uh, it fits in the bottom of this thing here just about perfectly. So... You know, that's exactly what we need. That and a little bit of can-do, and I think we can do this. So all that aside, the only reason I really needed my caliper for this is just to show you. I'm going to go ahead and do the one thing that's been bothering me is the mouthpiece area here. has kind of a, like, scarred-up area, so I'm going to just clip that off. The other side has the same thing. We'll be clipping that off in just a moment. I'm hoping that cutting this with these scissors isn't going to damage it too much. Just makes it look a little oblong, which I think I may wind up putting this on my belt sander to get it perfect. Gonna put that one time. And then let's say afterwards, I'll just use some sandpaper, put it on my belt sander to clean it up. So that'll be good. What we've really got to do though is mark where we're gonna place the fingerings. And if you've seen this book in some of my other videos, it's the art of Native American flute making. It has been uh, copied and redesigned several times by several other people, as I have noticed, but this is the one that you really want to get. It says, by Charlie and Jesse Montetoyella. I've been making flutes for a while now, so, uh, and actually, at this point in my life, I guess it's going on 33 years. Lots of experience in this book. But on page 120, there's the uh, schematics for how to make an E flute. Now, those are in standard notation, and on page 122, the same E flute in metric. And just like anything, I'm going to use some of both standard and metric. But you can see here where the uh, fingerings represent this measurement over here for like the E flute. 
and then uh, the distance is measured from the sound hole to the fingering. So that's what we're going to do. And then this uh, red color here is actually um, the size of one part of the hole, and then the 7 eighths is the size of another one of the holes, like the sound hole. But what I'm going to do is make them a little bit differently. So we may have to kind of fudge here and there on my measurements to get them exactly the way we need them to get it close to a key of E. I'm not going to make this perfect E. I vowed this time that this is just going to be as close as possible and not worry about getting too much detail here for everybody because really what we want is a playable, beautiful sounding instrument. We don't really care what key it's in at present. Um, so like I said, just going by these measurements and uh, we're actually instead of making a square hole here, which is usually what I do, I'm going to make a round uh, hole for the sound hole and then from here down just measure these appropriate fingering locations and let's see one most important thing is you're going to have to have a place to put this plug that I showed you a second ago so let's say that the mouthpiece Actually, that's the bottom side of the flute. Or look at me. I am so prepared today, aren't I? So let's say that the mouthpiece uh, end here, I want it to be about, I don't know, four or so inches away from the sound hole. It doesn't have to be four inches away from the sound hole. And you can do it any which way you like. Um, however, for me, that's usually kind of what looks good on a flute. It also uh, determines how far away from your mouth your fingerings are going to be. So, you know, kind of. One of those things I just usually do. And then likewise, I'm going to put about one inch behind that is going to be my air supply hole. So air supply hole, sound hole, this is going to be our mouthpiece area. And uh, the reason I put it about an inch behind is because this thing's about seven eighths and we need to give room enough to put the holes. And then going by what the book says, let's see. Once again, on page 120, uh, E flute, we're looking at the first fingering from the sound hole to the fingering is about six and a quarter inches. So let's measure six and a quarter inches. And let's see, six and a quarter. I'm trying to keep these in line. The next fingering is about seven and one eighth. So we're going to go down to seven and one eighth ish. The next one is eight and seven eighths of an inch. So eight and roughly seven eighths of an inch right there. The next fingering, we're looking at 10 and one eighth of an inch. So 10 and one eighth is right there. And then next, we're looking at 11 and one eighth, which is right there. And then finally, most importantly, the end of the flute on an E flute. If the diameter is about 7 eighths of an inch in diameter, which is where that blue number comes from, by the way, then we're looking at about a 17 inch long flute, give or take. Now, in my experience, I usually like to make things just a little bit longer, so let's make it 18 just for good measure, just in case, since we already know the inside diameter is roughly uh, one and a quarter, we know that there's going to be some change taking place in here. If you haven't seen it yet, I would like to mention I have a video on uh, changing your fingering pattern to fit the size of the material you're making your flute out of. So that's something really worthwhile watching if you haven't seen it yet. And if you're trying to make a flute based on another flute or based on measurements from my book, but your material is a different size. So that's something important to remember. This piece we're going to save. Um, let's see here. And likewise, for any of you who are using the metric system, I did save this page for you. <laughs> So from the sound hole to the first fingering, and then from the sound hole to the next fingering, and so on and so on, everything's measured from the sound hole. For an E flute, 159 millimeters for the first fingering, 181 for the next fingering, 225 for the third fingering, 257 for the next fingering, and 283 for the last fingering of the flute, going from top to bottom, and then the length of the flute roughly 432 millimeters, give or take. That's if you're using a material that is roughly 22 millimeters in diameter and all of your holes need to start off at about six millimeters-ish. So that should help. Anyway, so that's 
So the next thing we need to do is figure out how we're to drill these holes. I thought about using my trusty drill bit here and just kind of putting them in by hand because that is a decent enough technique that it works. I'm really a stickler for using a hobby knife though because it's so much faster to just get them started. And in just a moment, I'm going to do the thing that I always do, which you don't have to do, mind you. You can use hobby knife, drill bit, sandpaper, whatever you've got. There's so many other tools that you can do this with. I'm going to burn the holes out. That's what I always do. It works so well for so many reasons. So there's where the fingerings are going to go. And as you notice, they're poking out, you know, because we're using a hobby knife to do this with. Um, if I go back and burn these holes, the scar material will actually just burn up. And if we're careful, we won't burn the whole tube up. And likewise, we can go that route. If you only have a hobby knife at hand, if you're very careful, uh, you can actually just kind of clean these holes up a little bit and use some light sandpaper, which I think I have. Right here. And just kind of sand some of this stuff just to clean up the scar, tissue, scar material tissue on the outside. So there we go there. And voila. In just a second, I'm going to get this torch over here and start burning these holes as well. Let me see. So I'm doing the same thing with my sound hole up here. Trying to keep it reasonably in line. And then also my air supply hole. If you're using a hobby knife, you might want to be very careful not to stab yourself. I'm not poking into this thing like a lot of work or anything. So let's see here. And this is before we even put the plug in, so keep that in mind. Let's see. I'm going to use these and hopefully this torch works. This one's been giving me a problem for a while. Okay, look at that. Many of you know I have a stand that holds most of my uh, burning rods. Whenever we do flute making, we use burning rods to uh, clean the holes out of wood and everything else we make flutes out of. Back in the old days, my wife and I used to stand here and hold these rods. Oh my gosh. It took forever and a day to do this. Oh my gosh. On the upside, it really makes you appreciate using this tool. It really does, because you're thinking, you know, I'm just shaking this thing back and forth all over the place. And surprisingly enough, it can get red hot in no time. I'm going to bump it off a little bit. This one's got some excess carbon buildup from the other flutes that it's been making. I'm just going to lightly singe the inside of this guy just a little bit. If you notice, I did that at something of an angle. That angle does help. Now notice when I'm doing this as well, there's a little bit of fiber that's kind of burning there and singeing. It just kind of turns into a little ember, and then it looks like it stops. So if you use this technique, I'm not telling you to do this, but if you do, be careful and be mindful that this cardboard tube could catch a fire. And also, don't do anything like this indoors where, you know, the carbon dioxide or monoxide that's coming off of this tank here could cause you a problem. The smoke vapors coming off of the burnt cardboard or wood or whatever you're doing could cause a problem. Make sure that you're somewhere there's plenty of ventilation, which I'm actually in my shop, and although you can't see it, there's lots of doors open right now. See that hole in there glowing? I don't know if you can see that from the camera or not, but it 
is really glowing. Which means all those little fibers in there are burning. They're screaming, I'm burning, I'm burning. And then they stopped, which is good. Okay, and now I'm going to burn the air supply hole. Make sure the sound hole is good. And really, that's not too bad, I don't think. Might do one more thing to the sound hole here to try to ensure that it produces the amount of volume that I want and uh, that it's as clear as I'm aiming for. I'm just going to widen it a little bit. I think that looks good. Whatever you do to the sound hole, it's best to mirror image it on the air supply hole. Okay. I think that's got us on that. Turn old trusty Mr. Torch on. Okay. Well, if any of you had seen the carbonization going on there, but uh, it actually did a really good job. And most of it just blew right off. I may have to enlarge these holes a little bit in a moment. We'll get to that when the time comes. For right now, let's see. I'm going to go ahead and super glue this in too, which should help a little bit. My lovely assistant wouldn't mind getting me some super glue. Like I said, I was really prepared for this video this morning, and I wanted to make sure that you guys know all the trials and tribulations of flute making. Likewise, we're going to find out what it takes <laughs> to get this thing done. Let's see. I'm just cleaning up the hole a little bit. I said, just kind of making sure my scar tissue doesn't look bad, which you can see here. And I'm going to put a few drops of super glue in here to hold my plug in place. Now the plug I slid up right to the bottom edge of the sound hole. That's where you want it to be at, right along the edge there. There's some people that make it a little bit back and give a little space in here for a number of reasons. Those reasons may be valid, but today this is what we are doing. I'm also going to put a little bit of super glue. And you don't have to use a brand I use. I mean, there's so many good brands of super glue out there. I'll just recommend for this project, don't use a gel. I do like super glue gel a lot, but for this kind of project, it's not... Uh, not the best thing. You need something that is liquid and viscous that can penetrate and soak into something else. And that's what we're doing here. Okay. So a couple of spots inside that didn't get any glue. Now, what most of you consider to be the tricky part is I'm going to make, I guess I can draw this for you real quick. I'm going to make a line from here to here that connects my sound hole with my air supply hole. And that line, now that it has a wooden block underneath of it, hopefully not too terribly glued into place, <laughs> glued enough I hope, I'm going to use that to cut this little piece of cardboard out. Because of how thin the wall of this cardboard is, it should be the perfect track thickness. Okay. One thing about using super glue, I will advise, is the vapors that come off of it sometimes can be really strong. Uh, anytime it touches a porous material or a carbon based material like cardboard or wood, it uh, has a reaction with that, and it puts off some seriously strong vapors that could burn your eyes or your nose or anything, so you got to be careful. Okay. I can't wait to see what this thing is going to sound like. Once again, 
all I've done is trimmed out the cardboard between the air supply hole and the sound hole, and I've only left the wood. Now, I did this because the thickness of my dowel is such that it is perfectly um, designed for the thickness of my track. So having you know removed the cardboard, it left a little, um, I guess that's about a half a millimeter. It's kind of on the thin side, but because making cardboard flutes isn't exactly a perfect science, um, when you see my block I'll make here in just a moment, you'll understand why that, that'll work just fine. Right now I'm just going to clean up anything that looks like cardboard that's in the way of my track. Okay, then I think I'll use some sandpaper just to get any excess. Let's see what we can do here. Looking pretty good. I don't feel like this air supply hole is big enough, so I'm going to kind of carefully take a little bit more of it out. I don't want to make the air supply hole too big, but at least it needs to be nearly the same size as the sound hole. One important thing about doing that too is you don't want to leave any of these little pieces of wood fiber in there because they'll get trapped inside of the track when it's covered up by your block. And let's see where we're at. That's not too shady. I think that'll work for what we need it for. And then I'm going to show you what I'm going to save this piece for. Just trim this off. So now we have a piece of the original cardboard tube, and it's longer than the edge of my sound hole and track area, and goes back past the air supply hole. That's how that's going to sit. So I'm going to pick what looks like the best place to cut this thing. I'm just going to make a slit right there. Let's see how this works. Sounds like the track isn't nearly deep enough. So we have a solution for that as well. Never use fear. Do a little bit more of this on it. This is where using probably a uh, slightly thicker tube might have been a good solution, but the reason I want you to see this from start to finish is because you can't let anything stop you if you're going to start doing this. In my years of flute making, I've met people that said, if I could only do this, or if I only had that machine, or if I only had something to do it, I try to show as many different tools and ways you can do things as possible. This is just a little jewelry file. We actually use it for this purpose quite a bit in the shop. When you're making something like this, there are a few things that won't allow the flute to produce the sound that you're looking for. And one of those things is the air supply. If it's not large enough, if it's not small enough, if it's too large or too small, there's so many what ifs. This one's got a little booger right there, too. I think it's some super glue and cardboard that decided to merge into one. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and square this hole up just a little bit. Like I said, y'all know I really prefer square sound holes. Any of you who's been watching me for a while, it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect either. So, let's see if that did anything to it. That's number two. That's number two. Oh, that made quite
quite a different singer. These top two holes, like I said, are a little bit on the uh, off-key side. I'm going to go ahead and tie this leather lace around it. You might find something else that's a little more aesthetically correct, like a rubber band, <laughs> like I have on that other one. But uh, for right now, this leather lace will probably do the trick for me, just to hold it in place. I just don't want it to look like a cardboard flute with a nice you know, piece of leather lace on it. So you can hear it actually cleared the tone up a little bit, but in doing so, we sacrificed some of the volume. And that's pretty much the way it works, is you sacrifice a little something, and you get a little something else. So Now, had I not glued this block in place, I could actually take it to some sandpaper and go back and forth and just make a little flat area there. And that would uh, likewise give me a, a deeper track as well. Once again, lots of ways you can do this kind of thing. I tried to avoid showing my burning pools this time because, you know, except for the cleaning the holes out. But, you know, I usually use my track tool up here. I just don't want any of you to feel like you have to use any of the tools that I use. There's so many ways that you can make this flute play. I think she's looking pretty good. So let's uh, grab my torch so I can retune it a little bit. I'm going to put one of these new fancy rubber bands, which once again kind of look like it belongs here. Let's see. How about that? It wouldn't be a cardboard flute if it had something other than a rubber band holding in place. Let's fix these top two holes. Now, you can do this a number of different ways. I will tell you right off, one of our flute making kits that we sell, we have videos for how to make the holes larger by doing this number. That works great. It really does. Matter of fact, I may even do that to all of my fingerings once these top two are the larger size I need. I'm going to look at it on the tuner and see how close it is. You guys don't have to look at this, but I'll tell you. That's an E flat. F sharp, G sharp, B flat, C, which is what we got to fix. And like I said, I wanted it close to a E. E flat's okay. I'm just going to use this fire because it does such a clean job of making these holes nice and neat. You know, when we make flutes, too, we also have um, a number of different shape and size burning tools. I have a larger one, but the reason that I didn't want to bring that one out for sure is because it takes forever to heat up, you know. But once again, you don't have to do it like this either. There are so many ways you can enlarge those holes without using a hot rod. Almost a C sharp, not quite. Any of you that haven't guessed it yet, especially since I used the opportunity to make a plug for my flute making book, I should mention to you that uh, the reason that it's an E flat instead of an E is because I made it 18 inches instead of 17, like my book said. But that's okay, because as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, this one wasn't going to be exactly on the money. I'm going to clean these holes up with some sandpaper, and let's see what it sounds like.
So not sounding too bad. A little bit of uh, bottom end noise there, but that's because of the track. And I'm going to go back over that, I think, for just a second. I'm also going to make this top two holes a little prettier because in the process, of course, I did a little bit of something that made them less pretty. And pretty is sometimes important. First impressions and all that. Plus, if there are big holes like this, you know, sometimes the bigger the hole, the easier the mistake is to see. And if they're perfect, then people are like, huh, those are perfect. Okay, so let's see where we are at. Still just a little bit of sound coming off of the, the block here, but I think, I think I'm going to clean that up in just a moment. Maybe if I put the rubber band on the back side and leave the front side untouched. Really what it boils down to is I just need a little bit more track depth. I think that may have done the trick. Let's see. One really interesting thing yeah, here, that uh, I like about the uh, cardboard for a flute making material is that when it plays, because it's so thin and just so rigid, I can actually feel the vibrations of the flute playing because they just really resonate inside of the cardboard. I wish you guys could feel that. It almost tickles, like when you hear that one sound that kind of vibrates in your ear like a mosquito buzzing right there and, and you're like oh my gosh get out of my ear well, it's like that but it's enjoyable so something so really a flute that's got at least the sound quality of many very expensive flutes that you've probably seen, maybe bought, sometimes wish you had. Um, and I'm going to go back, like I say, and do a few things to it, clean it up a little bit, and, and make it look really nice, I think, and then probably hit it with a coat of something or another and uh, see if I can't make a beautiful work of art out of this. Otherwise, I guess disposable cardboard wrapping paper tube. Once again, I hope you guys have found some use in our videos here. That's the reason we really love uh, to make them. Uh, so many people comment and say, thanks for doing this. Thanks for uh, showing me how to do this. And some people have questions. How do you do this or how to do that? Nine times out of ten, we've already got a video. Because a lot of times people ask, how do you do this? And I say, well, we've got a video for that. And I send them a link to it. You can just go to our list of videos on YouTube under Blue Bear Flutes and just search in Blue Bear Flutes videos and find just about anything you could, you could dream of. Uh, sometimes it's difficult if you don't know the terminology for something or if you're not sure exactly what to search for, but you're trying to find out how to solve a problem. Um, and that's where it comes in real handy to email us too. So in which case, I hope that you guys have enjoyed this video. Once again, my name is Charlie Montefiella from Blue Bear Flutes and BlueBearFlutes.com. Don't forget to subscribe, like us, share with everybody you know, and then make sure that they share with everybody they know. And we'll hope to see you again very soon. Y'all take care. Thank mm -hmm. you.